All right, everybody, welcome to our third Vave EduCast. I'm Renee Deverstal, your Chief Medical Officer, and we have lined up a really exciting group of people today to speak to you about their experiences with ultrasound in the medical education spectrum. So as per usual, we really want you to share your questions with us. So we're live on YouTube, LinkedIn, Twitter, et cetera, our website. So please send in questions throughout the entire time. At the end, there'll be Q&A and I'll make sure that we have time to share them, get answers for you from whomever you want. So um, first up, we have Dr. Nina Mason. She is a PhD and she is actually the Director of Gross Anatomy at Rocky Vista University in the Southern Utah campus. So she's an associate professor um, of all kinds of fun scientific stuff she's gonna tell you about in a minute. And so I met with her earlier in the week. She's gonna be live for questions, but with the slides we wanted to pre-record for her. So I met with her earlier in the week and I asked her, you know, Nina, you've been doing this for a while. There's a lot of people out there still trying to figure out how to meld ultrasound into the foundational sciences. So I'd ask what, in which ways do you feel like POCUS or ultrasound really augments your curriculum. And also, you know, really, you've done a lot of cool work in this space. So what what are you most proud of? And so we are really excited to get to hear what she has to say. And I hope you all think of some great questions for her at the end of this session. So we're going to march ahead. Hi, Dr. Deverstall. Thank you so much for having me today. Those are some really fantastic questions. But before I answer, I'd like to introduce myself briefly, if that's okay. So I'm Dr. Nina Mason. I've been teaching medical students in three disciplines, anatomy, physiology, and ultrasound for about six years. Although I've got to confess, ultrasound is my favorite discipline to teach. When I was first introduced to ultrasound in my first year as a full-time faculty member, I immediately fell in love with it. I remember attending a POCUS boot camp at Oregon Health and Sciences University, and I couldn't get enough from that point on. I think I've had about 120 credits of ultrasound education since that day, and I can't seem to stop. It's a really fun thing to be involved with. So currently I serve as the Director of Gross Anatomy at Rocky Vista University's Southern Utah campus. And I also am involved in running and delivering all of our first year ultrasound laboratories to our medical students. It's been an absolute blast to get to teach both anatomy and ultrasound since those two disciplines work so well to complement one another within the curriculum. Now, when considering your questions, there are several items that come to my mind when thinking about how ultrasound best augments our curriculum. We have a series of ultrasound labs that are built into the preclinical years of our curriculum, which you can see on this slide here. There's six labs that are shown in blue that are our first year labs and six labs that are our second year labs that are shown in green. So I'm responsible for all of the lab sessions that are shown in blue. And we have these sessions sequenced within our calendar so that they can best augment the other things that we're doing in our curriculum. So all of our views anatomical dissection also takes place in the first year of medical school. And we sequence our ultrasound labs within the calendar so that they take place a few days after a given dissection of a region. So for example, say in their integrated cardiovascular course, on Monday they might do a dissection of the thorax. And then on Wednesday, a few days later, they'll come into the ultrasound lab and scan the heart and the lungs. And then perhaps maybe the next week, they'll take a written exam that covers all of the components of their integrated cardiovascular course. And that exam will have a few ultrasound questions on it related to the lab that they covered in the previous week. And those will be image-based questions so they can kind of um, prove that they can recognize the sonographic anatomy. The first year labs are focused on teaching students three basic things. So we work on image acquisition with the students of course, transducer handling skills, and we teach them how to recognize the sonographic anatomy using acoustic windows all over the body. We found that integrating our labs with our anatomy component in this way, so it's not necessarily part of the anatomy course, but the courses are sequenced or the labs are sequenced in such a way that the two disciplines can complement each other as much as possible. So we found that the ultrasound really helps the students understand like why the anatomy is important and the clinical relevance of the things that they learn in the anatomy lab. And ultrasound, of course, is a wonderful standalone clinical tool that provides them with a very clinically relevant skill for the rest of their careers. And for me, it's so much fun to be involved in teaching both because anatomy is basically just a feeder into ultrasound, right? Ultrasound is actually just live human anatomy. Our second year labs that you can see here listed in green 
are more clinically focused. So they're taught by one of my colleagues who's an MD physician. And those labs are taught using case study formats, which of course also have accompanying scan times, but they're more focused on the pathology and understanding and interpreting what kinds of things can go wrong in the various body regions and how ultrasound can help them at the bedside to diagnose and treat patients. The ultrasound labs in the second year are part of a longitudinal primary care medicine course. And at the end of that course, the students are given another set of written um, ex image-based exam questions to test their knowledge on ultrasound. But they're also asked to perform in a uh, practical exam to demonstrate the image acquisition skills that they've learned in labs throughout the second year. There are ultrasound opportunities within our third and fourth year curriculum, but a bulk of our curricular ultrasound education takes place within the first two years. And I found that ultrasound really helps the anatomy come alive for the students within the first year curriculum, and that second year really helps cement their skills and their understanding of the clinical medicine as it relates to ultrasound. Outside the curriculum, I say that student ultrasound clubs and interest groups can be a really great way to bring ultrasound education to any program. I'm the faculty advisor for Rocky Vista's Ultrasound Society, which is just what we call our student ultrasound interest club. And we put together many great events for our student body. I think my favorite event from last year though was something that we called case study rounds, which involved us going into our big empty lab space and setting up maybe five stations in a circle around the lab. And at each station, there was an ultrasound machine and a laptop with a case study on it. And of course, a club officer or a faculty member to help facilitate the learning at each of those case study stations. So we would have students come in and they would spend about 15 minutes at each station going through the case study. And the case studies were very brief. They were just like a patient presentation and then maybe two to three ultrasound scans that were done on that patient to help solve the case. And then a quick diagnosis and clinical resolution for that case. And then after the students would go through the case study, they would then perform the scans on each other that were used in that case. So they got a chance to actually practice the skills that would have been necessary to solve the case with that patient on each other. And this was a really fantastic opportunity for my club to provide ultrasound education to the entire student body, as well as the very important context for why they should care about those scans, like how they actually could be used in their careers and used to help improve patient care. It's in this type of setting that I'm actually most excited to use some of the educational tech that VAVE has come up with to augment ultrasound education. Particularly here, I would like to use the VAVEcast feature, which I think is genius because one of the main problems that we have in this type of learning environment is invariably you'll find something really cool on one student or uh, maybe a great acoustic window or something like an interesting pathology and you'll want everyone in the lab to come see it. So what ends up happening is hey, everybody come look at this. And then there's a big stampede all over the lab of everybody coming to look. And it takes about 10 minutes of people shuffling in and out to have everybody get to see that. So if we could use something like Bathecast instead to make sure that everyone could view that pathology quickly on their own device and then move on to what they were doing, that would save us a lot of time in these sorts of events. But I think of all the educational ultrasound activities that we have, the one that I'm most proud of has occurred because of my educational research projects. Because I'm an anatomist, I find it really rewarding to be able to teach ultrasound to medical students because it enables a basic scientist like myself to have a chance to contribute in a meaningful way to the clinical education of my medical students, as well as provide them with a skill that they can use throughout the rest of their careers. And as an associate professor of both anatomy and ultrasound, I really love to find ways to meld those two disciplines together. And I've been most successful at doing that through my research. So I have an ultrasound education lab of about 30 students that are doing various projects. And generally the purpose of my education lab is to find innovative ways to utilize ultrasound technology and human cadavers to teach medical students how to perform ultrasound guided procedures. To do this, we put on a series of really fun and hands-on cadaver scanning labs where we'll have students come in to learn to perform procedures that are ultrasound guided, like knee arthrocentesis, central line placement, and fracture identification, all using human cadavers. When we measure the effectiveness of those training activities, that's kind of what we end up publishing as our study. But the most valuable part of it for me is having the students come in and actually learn the clinical skills. On this slide here, there are images of two of my most recent research projects. The panel A on the left side, you can see an ultrasound image there at the bottom. And this image is showing you an image of a cadaver knee of the suprapatellar bursa. 
and you can actually see there's some anechoic synovial fluid there, and there's a needle that's accessing the space, which is a student that's performing ultrasound-guided knee arthrocentesis on this cadaver. This was a really fun project because it enabled the students to come in and learn a clinical skill in a very low stress environment. Another project that we did, which is shown on the right side of the slide in panel B, is um, creating fractures in formalin embalmed cadavers to teach students how to use ultrasound to find fractures. So the ultrasound image that you see at the bottom of the slide on panel B is of a fracture that we actually created in a cadaver tibia. So what we would do is go in and make a bunch of fractures over various types of cadaver bones. And then we would sew up the skin after we made the fracture and then cover the fracture site with an opaque standoff pad. The standoff pads were used to make sure the students couldn't tell where the fracture sites were that we had created. And then we would have students come into the lab and scan a series of cadaver bones to try to tell us which ones were fractured and which ones weren't. Both of these research projects and others like it that we have done have been great because they create hands-on engaging learning environments for students to learn to perform procedures that would really not be fun to learn on a live patient for the first time. So with these controlled learning environments, there's no risk for patient discomfort throughout the learning process. I, I have yet to hear any of my cadavers complain about students not actually hitting the super patellar bursa the first three or four times that they poke a needle into the knee. And that's been a really great benefit for these students to get to learn how to perform these sorts of procedures without um, being stressed out and doing it on a live patient. So in summary, I'd say that there are numerous ways that ultrasound can greatly enhance many aspects of the medical curriculum. In addition to being a powerful standalone clinical tool, it's also just an amazing piece of technology with so many exciting applications, both in ultrasound education and in clinical medicine. So great questions. Thanks for letting me speak today. Okay, well, I hope you all are really inspired and have the creative juices flowing. I knew Nina was a rock star, but I didn't realize quite the, the level of research in that ultrasound education research lab I'm incredibly jealous of. So please think of some great questions for her uh, for when we are done. So next up, we have Stephen Lockwood, who is an MS4 here at OHSU. And uh, he actually was also pre-recorded because it's really exciting. He is at an interview. So we have a little recorded intro and he's going to go through some slides he prepared for you all. And this is about the student experience with ultrasound and what it can provide to them. Not just some fun, cool thing, but really ways that it can augment um, for them as well. So let's hear Stephen. Hello, everyone. My name is Steve Lockwood. I'm actually pre-recording this right now because I'll be in a residency interview during the live Educast. I just wanted to say hello and introduce myself. If you have any questions, Renee can provide my contact information as needed. I hope you enjoy the presentation. Thanks. Hello everyone. My name is Steve Lockwood. Today I'll be speaking a little bit about my experience learning point-of-care ultrasound in order to provide a student perspective on its utility in medical education. I'd like to start by providing a little bit of background information about myself. I'm a fourth-year medical student at Oregon Health and Science University, currently applying into anesthesiology with an interest in pursuing critical care fellowship training. My involvement with ultrasound started in the first year of medical school as part of a super user group, which ultimately led to the opportunity to help create and run introductory ultrasound courses for other medical students. In conjunction with this, over the past six weeks, I've been participating in an advanced ultrasound clinical elective with various specialties throughout OHSU. During this presentation, my goal is to provide a student perspective on the educational role that early point-of-care ultrasound education has played during three major parts of my medical education, the preclinical years, third-year clerkships, and fourth-year sub-internships. In terms of the preclinical years, I've found that ultrasound contributed extensively to my understanding of anatomy, physiology, and physical examination. From an anatomy perspective, 
Learning basic point of care ultrasound was incredibly beneficial in generating a spatial awareness of the organs within the human body. A good example of this is cardiac anatomy. All too often, medical students are taught to think about the heart as four boxes in two-dimensional space, which of course doesn't take into account the complexities of cardiac anatomy. Even after completing dissections in anatomy lab, you don't necessarily have a great perspective of something like how the heart is oriented within the human body. However, being able to perform and understand something like a parasternal short axis ultrasound at the level of the aortic valve clearly demonstrates the three-dimensional nature of the human heart. Similarly, ultrasound has clearly aided in my learning of cardiopulmonary physiology. Examples include understanding things like pressure volume loops, physiologic changes in preload and afterload, tamponade physiology, etc. Being able to see these concepts depicted in real time, as opposed to only as an image or a figure in a textbook, serve to reinforce and cement these ideas for me. I think in general, physical examination is one of the harder things to teach medical students, as it isn't just a concept, but also a skill that requires hands-on repetitions and practice. However, as another medical student once mentioned to me, ultrasound kind of feels like a cheat code for physical exam. Regardless, I do think that ultrasound was invaluable in learning and reinforcing the basics of physical examination. Examples include using a stethoscope in conjunction with an ultrasound machine to correlate S1 and S2 heart sounds to the actual closing, closing and opening of valves in real time as well as to corroborate physical exam findings of things like heart murmurs, effusions, lung sounds, etc. I definitely remember a physical exam teaching session early in medical school that involved sitting with nine or ten other students around a recording of a heart murmur, with our faces scrunched up, trying to determine if it was crescendo or decrescendo, with an instructor repeatedly telling us, just listen to it, just close your eyes and listen to it. Well, I will say that being able to auscultate heart murmurs is a good skill to have. Being able to use point of care ultrasound and color Doppler to evaluate for valvular problems at the patient's bedside felt like a game changer when I learned about it and acted as a way to confirm my exam findings. POCUS also provided a clearer understanding of things like JVP measurement, as well as things like where to percuss the liver edge or palpate the spleen since it's so easy to confirm the location of these organs with ultrasound. Starting third-year clerkships, I was surprised at how frequently I would find residents and attendings that were not comfortable or familiar performing ultrasound examinations on their patients. Because of this, prior point-of-care ultrasound teaching truly allowed me to be a contributing member of the team and an active participant in patient care. Many times an attending or resident would say something like, have that med student that knows how to ultrasound go take a look at that patient's heart or lungs or JVP. Ultimately, I would say that having a strong foundation in point of care ultrasound leading into clerkships helped improve patient care in terms of evaluation, diagnosis, and treatment, while allowing me as a student to play an important role as opposed to just acting as an observer. Going into sub-internships, I was able to proactively use ultrasound for patient evaluations on the wards and in the emergency department. I was able to present my findings to attendings and actually use my ultrasound examination to generate a more accurate assessment and treatment plan. My strong foundations in ultrasound also allowed me to be more facile with ultrasound-guided procedures being taught to me, things like central lines, arterial lines, lumbar punctures, abscess, incision and drainage, etc., due to my experience and understanding of ultrasound. Even little things like familiarity with things as simple as probe selection, marker orientation, etc., definitely made it easier to learn the aforementioned procedures. Ultimately, incorporating ultrasound into sub-internships 
made me feel like I could be more confident in my overall evaluations of patients by combining history and physical examination with ultrasound examination at the bedside to come up with a clear, focused plan for each patient I evaluated. Point-of-care ultrasound training has served not just as a tremendous learning opportunity for me, but has also provided me with an opportunity to teach other students, which I hope to carry forward into my future practice. It's also provided an entry point for involvement in a growing field of research, which I hope to continue with in my future career as well. It's allowed me to stay on the cutting edge of medical training, which I think is increasingly important, given that multiple attending physicians have stated that it's drastically more difficult to learn a new skill after completion of training, reinforcing the need to incorporate skills such as point-of-care ultrasound early on in medical training. Most importantly, the point-of-care ultrasound education I've received throughout medical school will undoubtedly improve the care I provide to my future patients as an intern, as a resident, and ultimately as an attending physician. In closing, I'd just like to say that being able to learn point-of-care ultrasound has been one of the highlights of medical education for me. It's reinforced basic concepts like anatomy, physiology, and physical examination, while allowing me to play a meaningful role in patient care as a student on clerkships, while enabling me to play an increasingly proactive role as a sub-intern. Point-of-care ultrasound represents a tangible skill that will carry forward with me into residency training that will undoubtedly improve the care of my future patients. Thank you so much for your time. Okay, well, there's rock star number two. I forgot to mention a couple of things. Apologies, I can hear myself, which makes it distracting. Forgot to mention a couple of other things at the beginning. Uh, you didn't get to see the little picture in picture of Steve because my Wi-Fi was being so terrible when we interviewed on Monday. Uh, the other thing we were initially, I was going to do this with a Toro University Nevada student because we are so excited about our partnership with them that we announced last month. But I actually decided I want them to have their own entire Educast episode. So. Once we've rolled out all of the cool stuff we're planning um, in the spring, we're going to do one entirely with Toro uh, preclinical, clinical, and faculty. Um, so we're excited for that. So now it is time to hear from our third rock star. Dr. Kaisa McSky is a current intern at Hennepin County Medical Center out in Minneapolis. And she is one of our former student super users. And now in her internship, as I mentioned, and so I wanted to bring her here to say not just, okay, here's the student who said they thought it was fun and I learned a lot and I'll do a lot, but she's now doing it in the ER at one of the, like a very, very, very well-known program, a very well-known POCUS program. So I wanted to hear if she, if we prepared her well and what she felt it brought to her education and her current clinical care. So bear with me as I transition to Kaisa and myself both. Here we go. Let's get her on there. Nope, that's that's Kaisa. I'm still learning a little bit of the ropes, y'all. So here we have Kaisa with us. And so Kaisa, I would love to hear um, your thoughts on, on your impact as a student, impact now as a learner, or as a learner. You're still a learner, but as an intern. Yeah, absolutely. I'm really happy to be here. Um, I don't have any slides like our prior two presenters, but I'm just going to talk a little bit about kind of my experience with ultrasound in medical school and how I feel like it really helped me in the residency application process and now in residency. Um, just a little bit about me before we get started. I grew up in Southern Oregon and then moved to New York City for college and then got to come back to the great state of Oregon for medical school. Now I live in the tundra that is Minneapolis. It snowed six inches yesterday. It snowed about eight inches in October. Um, so adjusting to life here. <laughs> and I just finished my fifth month of residency. Um, like Renee said, I'm going to be here and talk about kind of my experience as now an intern. Um, but before I talk about that, I just want to talk a little bit about what first got me involved in ultrasound and why I feel like it really matters and why I'm particularly interested. And forgive me, I have some notes off to the side, so if I look away once in a while, that's what I'm doing. 
Um, I first took a two-week elective at the beginning of my third year in ultrasound with Renee um, and one of the ultrasound techs at OHSU and just absolutely loved it. I felt like I learned so much in such a short time period and in such a low stress environment, which I think Dr. Mason had mentioned earlier, um, which just was like the opposite of kind of the rest of my third year, which felt like a really high stress, high pressure environment where I didn't always learn a lot and it was always stressful. Um, so kind of with that first two week kind of initial exposure to ultrasound, um, I was really hooked and kind of throughout my third year and beginning of the fourth year, continued to be involved in teaching activities and continuing ultrasound learning for my sake. Um, when I look about towards my future, maybe I'm a little naive, but I really want to be a minimalist in how I practice and a minimalist in how I work up my patients. I think that we tend to overwork up our patients a lot and it leads to expensive hospital bills, uh, exposure to a lot of radiation, not to mention the kind of emotional and psychological cost of over diagnoses and incidental findings on CT. Um, and I find that ultrasound is a really efficient and low cost way to get answers to your clinical questions and possibly avoid some of these other workups. Um, I'm also really interested in practicing in low resource and international settings and the ultrasound is really translatable to kind of every work environment you can imagine, especially now that they're coming out with phone apps and butterflies and kind of all these other things that make it really easy to use ultrasound kind of whenever you want, which is really exciting. Um, lastly, I think one of the things that's so exciting for me is that the biggest limiting ultras limiting factor in ultrasound is often you, the person doing it or the person reading it. Yeah, you can certainly get a better machine or you can get better resolution, but ultimately what makes an ultrasound good and what makes an ultrasound useful is how good you are, how good I am. And I find that really exciting and inspiring to be better. Um, I think Steve mentioned this a little bit, um, but I think as a learner, ultrasound is so, so helpful because you get to see kind of the direct correlation of this pathology that you talked about. Um, and I see that all the time now as an intern and using ultrasound regularly. If I'm in a patient room and I'm concerned someone has hydronephrosis, I can either order a CT and I'm going to go see a few other patients. I'm going to do a couple other tasks. Maybe sign out is coming up. Finally, I get back to looking at that CT read and it radiologist reads as hydronephrosis. And if I'm busy, I might not look at that CT for a while. And so the kind of diagnosis to kind of clinical picture is a little disjointed and a little separate. And the other alternative is I walk into the room, I'm concerned someone has hydronephrosis and I put an ultrasound probe on them and I see it. And I think that kind of direct and immediate correlation really reinforces pathology for learners, um, for medical students, for interns kind of along your pathway, that kind of direct and really close reinforcement is a really exciting opportunity to see what's actually going on inside someone's body. So kind of with all this in mind of what I just talked about, I pursued an eight-week elective during the end of my fourth year in ultrasound and worked with uh, Renee to kind of really create it. Um, I really wanted to kind of learn more and explore more because as Steve mentioned, I felt like I was so well prepared on my sub-eyes with the limited ultrasound training I already had. I thought, you know, how much more could I learn in eight weeks? How much more confident could I be stepping into the hospital my first day of my intern year? And so during those eight weeks, I did a lot of hands-on scanning. I did a lot of theoretical learning. And something that I found that I really loved was I got to do a lot of teaching. Ultrasound is a really hard thing to learn. It can be really hard to wrap your mind around at first. Um, and because of that, I think it's also really hard to teach it at first. It's a hard kind of hands-on skill to get someone else to move the probe in the right way to kind of get the image that you want. And I felt like during my eight weeks of that elective, I got to explore how to teach that efficiently and how to kind of give students the opportunity to learn how to get those images themselves. Um, as a resident, I will be expected to teach interns, to teach medical students, and throughout the rest of my life, I'll be expected to continue to learn and to continue to teach. And I was really excited to get so much teaching experience with people like Renee and Chrissy, the ultrasound tech, kind of watching me and giving me guidance on how to teach better. One of the other really nice things I think that came out of all my ultrasound work, um, before I talk a little bit more about internship, um, was all the connections and kind of social networking that I got out of it. During my time at OHSU, I became pretty close to the EM ultrasound fellows as well as the IM ultrasound fellows. And I actually got to go to the Oregon um, College of Emergency Physicians conference um, to do kind of some ultrasound work and some ultrasound modeling and got to just chat with other like-minded folks there. Um, the ultrasound world is a pretty small world and it's been really fun to see how many people know each other and how much of an overlap there really is. Reflecting back a little bit on residency and interviews and applications, I think the work that I did in ultrasound was really helpful. It showed that I had this continued and long-term interest and passion in a topic. 
as ultrasound becomes more and more embedded in the medical world, it's becoming an expected skill, especially for me as an emergency medicine physician, and it's built into my entire curriculum. At the same time, there's very little required formal education so far in medical school on ultrasound. So the work that I did really stood out to residency programs when I applied and interviewed. Um, and I was frequently asked about my experience on interviews, and it gave me a really easy talking point for when I got the very loved question, what questions do you have for me? Yeah. Um, and I think, and this is just conjecture, I'm certainly not a, involved in program leadership, but as step one becomes pass-fail, and as medical schools start moving towards pass-fail for clerkships, I think programs, I would imagine, are going to look more and more to uh, applicants' participation and involvement in extracurricular activities and involvement in ultrasound type early on in medical school gives you a really wonderful way to develop a niche for yourself. Um, and that's certainly what I found myself doing. That sounds like what Steve has done. Um, and that's a kind of really exciting to be a part of and to be able to talk about that. My first few weeks of residency were absolutely terrifying. I had no idea what I was doing medically. I was in a totally new hospital system. Mixed that in with being kind of constantly lost and not knowing where the bathroom was <laughs> is a mixed, really a pretty stressful situation. And one of the things I did feel somewhat confident about during that first month was my ultrasound skills. As Renee mentioned earlier, um, Hennepin is really at the forefront for a lot of focus in the emergency department. And it's a continued expected part of our practice um, we have machines everywhere, we're expected to use them, we're expected to use that information in real time to inform our practice. Um, and it was really nice to be able to show up and be able to go do a cardiac ultrasound or a fast or whatever and feel somewhat confident in my images and my interpretation. And this isn't to say that you should go into ultrasound medical school because your faculty will like you or you'll be able to impress someone and you should do it because you're going to be a better doctor for it and you're going to be able to take care of your patients better. Um, but feeling confident and comfortable so early on was also really nice for me. <laughs> um, since being here, I've gotten to be involved in a lot of kind of continued ultrasound opportunities and to learn more and become better. Um, I use ultrasound, like I was saying earlier, several times in every single shift, and it really gives me real-time information to inform my patient care. Um, and because it's so relevant, it's kind of pushed me to continue to learn. Um, as a second year, we have the opportunity to do a lot of teaching and ultrasound work with the university students here in Minneapolis, and I'm already really excited to do that. I firmly believe that the ultrasound work that I did in medical school has made me a more, made me a more competitive residency applicant and really set me up for success in residency. And for the students listening to this, I would really encourage you to get involved in any ultrasound opportunities that you can have at your school. And for the people involved in medical education, Give your students these opportunities. It will make them stronger students. It will give them the tools to learn their clinical exams and their clinical skills, and it will set them up for success in residency and beyond. I love it. Thank you so much. And I promise everyone, I didn't know. So I asked Kaisa because she sent the loveliest text to Chrissy, our educational stenographer, and myself saying on one of her first shifts in July, oh my gosh, you guys, I just have to tell you that the stenographer just complimented me on my ultrasound skills. So I totally, I knew that she would have a good thing to say, but I did not pick her to say nice things about us in our elective. That was not on purpose. <laughs> um, but yeah, really, it's so wonderful to hear um, and, and to know that the work that you do, you know, makes a difference. We all love it. So um, Steve is not going to be here. I'm going to text some questions in case he's in between. It is fancy Vanderbilt anesthesia uh, elective or rotation. I'm going to take us to three screens and I'm going to pull over Nina, Dr. Mason here. Excellent. There we go. I'm going to put on our little Q&A thing. I think this will sh should show up for y'all. Hooray, I am finally learning the system. Okay, so now is the moment you all have been waiting for. I really hope that we're gonna get some excellent questions for these three really fantastic speakers, enthusiastic ultrasound advocates. If not, I have things written down, but I would love to be able to advocate for your questions. Okay, let's see. What are the toughest challenges as a student you see in using ultrasound as part of your curriculum? Perfect. So Kaisa, you give that from your experience and I'm going to text this to Steve and see if he has a minute to text us back. Sure. So sorry, just to make sure I know, the question was like the most difficult things as a student to include it in the curriculum. Yeah. The toughest challenges as a student you see in using ultrasound as part of your curriculum. So maybe specifically like when you're not on my elective or something like that. Totally. I think that is definitely the hardest part and can also be a really exciting part. Um, as Steve mentioned earlier, depending on kind of like what service you're on or what rotation you're on, 
ultrasound might not be a built-in kind of part of that team's practice. And so it can feel at times like you're kind of forcing your voice to be heard. Um, or you have to take a step back and say, you know, I might not actually use ultrasound on this rotation or on this day. Um, but if you're able to kind of push for it, um, it really does make you an invaluable member of the team in this really unique way that you might not otherwise have as a student. Um, I think you gave a good example about kind of doing a cardiac ultrasound. But one thing that like I use ultrasound for all the time that I think I did as a student too is we talk all the time about volume status of the patient. Do they have too much volume? Do they have too little volume? Should we give more? Should we give less? And ultrasound you can use in real time to kind of look at how tolerant someone might be to getting more fluid. And if you're the person who knows how to do that, like you can go do that and you can report back to your attending or your resident and say, hey, you know, I think we need to stop or we need more or what, what have you. But it really gives you this kind of exciting opportunity to be really involved as an equal team member in patient care when sometimes that can be really hard to do as a student. For sure. So we'll see if Steve texts back. I have an opinion as an attending on what I tell my peer attendings, but I actually have one for Nina next. Um, so you said, you know, and of course, it seems like I only picked people to make OHSU sound great. That wasn't the case. But Nina had come to our very first uh, kind of boot camp that we'd done that was for residency program leaders, other educators uh, back like four years ago or five years ago. Who knows? Um, so you were in your career, though, you were, you were, you know, actively you're the professor. And so how did you go about getting to feel competent in something that you didn't learn in your education? Because that's something that's a really large barrier for people. Oh, Nina, you're, I think we have you muted. Or can other people, Shantanu, can, no, you, can you hear me? No. Okay, great. Sorry about that. Hi, oh, that's a fantastic question. So I remember going to that boot camp, which was my first, as you said, my first sort of ultrasound education based experience. Um, I hadn't even finished my dissertation yet. So I had started teaching full time, but I was still just very early, like first semester of teaching um, at a medical school. And uh, we didn't have any machines yet. And I had been asked by a colleague to go attend the boot camp at OHSU. And I just loved it. So as soon as I got back, I spent probably the next month filling out grant forms to try to get a machine for our school <laughs> so that I could start incorporating ultrasound and start our own student interest group and try to get the ball rolling in that way. So that was uh, um, a really great way to start that off because those boot camps are very intensive, sort of eight hours a day scanning for two days and you get to look at all the different windows. And as you mentioned, it was mostly with uh, mostly other ER docs is who I was in the room with. So it was great to kind of hear the clinical relevance that they would share with their own um, clinical stories at that boot camp. And then I went to every event that I could find that was like that from then on. And I was able to acquire quite a bit of skill in a short amount of time because as we know, ultrasound and anatomy are very closely linked disciplines. And it was just a, a great way for me to be able to teach about the anatomy that I was already teaching using this amazing new tool. And I was able to understand pretty well what I was looking at since I had a good understanding of the relationships between 3D organs and things like that. I think that's an excellent point is that I relearned so much anatomy as I was getting better and better and better at POCUS, but being out of medical school and they having that understanding, um, I, th I think is a, is a great asset. Um, thank you for that. And so Steve has texted back and he says that for him, one of the biggest issues was retaining skills. Sometimes he felt like ultrasound learning was like two steps forward, one step back, because you will have a period where you don't use it. And so this is my educator hat comes on. And that's one of the important, you know, ed theory, we know all about longitudinal training and that it helps reduce skill decay and you have to use it or lose it. So this is the big push for longitudinal ultrasound training in medical schools and in residencies. Um, and then he also said the other thing is that some attendings are a bit resistant and still look down on it. You know, it's the minority, but it certainly still exists. And that's what I would throw in as an internist. My people tend to be a little bit more conservative and want the data and a randomized controlled trial of ultrasound for hydronephrosis before like adopting it. So um, I just tell people, you are the clinician, you have your own pretest probability, post-test, you know, you know what you think, let your students play, let them ultrasound. And if what they find changes what you're thinking that much, phone a friend, get a formal ultrasound, get another study, but don't let your fear block your students from, from learning and growing. And the same goes for residents. Um, so, okay, perfect. So next question, as a teacher or faculty, how do you measure pro 
uh, sorry, okay, I can't talk. How do you measure progress of your students' ultrasound competency? Um, Nina, do you wanna take a crack and then I can chime in? Sure. Yeah, so our um, ultrasound competencies involve um, having them come in and then we have a series of um, scans and windows that they should have been able to achieve by this point and then we'll pick random ones off that list. So they kind of have an idea of what they might be asked to do on their competencies, but they don't know which, which scans we're gonna ask them to perform. And so as far as uh, measuring their skills over time, we haven't had a great mechanism for doing that. We just have the one competency evaluation, sorry, um, competency evaluation at the end of second year. But um, that's a great question. Do you have an opinion on that, Dr. Devishal? I'm gonna go hit my light again to shut off. Yeah, no worries, time out, or it's good for electricity, but not good for sitting still. So for us, I think you have to be cognizant about what you're talking about. What competency do you want to assess? Because there's not just one part of ultrasound. So I often love to talk about the POCUS pillars and there's image acquisition, image interpretation, and then your clinical integration. And so um, for image acquisition, an OSCE is the perfect way to do that. Start off with standardized patients or peers. It's a lot easier more slender people move into the hospital with the usual body habitus uh, for image interpretation. That's where we can do all kinds of multiple choice questions, Kahoot quizzes. If you go back, if people go back to our last Educast, there's a fantastic talk about our cognitive POCUS elective that Christine Schutzer created for us. And um, for instance, right now I have a med student, a second year med student who they ran out of preceptorships because nobody would take students due to COVID. And so I said, well, I'll do a virtual one and she can do two hours of online POCUS education a week and then come to our image review for two hours. And yesterday she knew everything. She rocked it. We were like, okay, so Brie, how do you, what do you do? Where would I get to see the aorta? And she said, Santa anterior, second year student who's literally never touched a probe. And so in two weeks, I'm going to meet her in the hospital and we're going to see what we can do image acquisition wise, having never touched a probe. We have theories about cognitive load and other things, but I won't go into that. Um, but yeah, you got to, what are you trying to assess? And so um, another thing is um, for image acquisition, the uh, portfolios and other things like Kais is going to have to do a certain portfolio via her throughout her residency. Um, I have another question coming in. Do you see ultrasound replacing stethoscope as a part of medical training or will it be an adjunct that will have its own role in place? It's okay, I'll chime in. And then maybe I would love for Kaisa to chime in. So um, first of all, my internist friend will stone me if I say like replacing the stethoscope, but also there are technological limitations. Okay, this is a Vave podcast, rad. We can swap out our batteries, but what if I'm in a place where I don't have electricity to recharge them? Or, you know, what if it, th there's always gonna be room for the stethoscope. We're just adding another tool to the tool bag. And as Dr. Bruce Kimura once said, and he held up his stethoscope and he held up his ultrasound, he said, I don't care what tool you choose, just get back to the bedside. Get back to the bedside with your learners and take care of your patients face to face. So, Kaisa, let's hear your. You have to top that epic quote. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was hard to follow. Um, <laughs> I was going to say a lot of the similar things. Um, I don't think it will replace it. I think there's a time and a place for both. I think the wonderful thing, as you just mentioned, about ultrasound is that, again, you're at the bedside and patients love when you ultrasound them. They. Uh -huh get a therapeutic thing they get the, their doctor their provider at bedside with them they get to talk so i think like that in and of itself is great um but there's always limitations to tech and there's always the risk that you're gonna run out of your batteries or your screen's gonna break or something is going to happen that being said on the other hand trying to listen to someone's heart in a busy urban er where everyone's screaming also okay. like not not super easy so I, I don't know if it'll replace it i think it's another tool that will allow us to hopefully take better care of our patients and treat them better it's a phenomenal point. One of my friends was on the COVID unit um, down in Santa Rosa and had texted me. He doesn't even practice ultrasound, but he's like, yo, ultrasound needs to be mandatory because I can't hear a thing over this capper. The, you know, the full, there's the fan in his own vent. He's like, I can't hear a single damn thing. So maybe certain patients it will. Um, okay. Well, we are about out of time. Nina, any closing thoughts from you? Any last parting pearls? It was phenomenal to hear you talk about your work. Um. Just to encourage all of you out there to uh, promote the POCUS uh, cause, if you will, wherever you are. If you work at a medical school, try to get it involved in your curriculum any way you can. And if you can't get it into your curriculum, 
maximize the use of those student interest groups. And if you're in the clinic, try to um, incorporate its use in any way that you possibly can. All right. How about you, Kaisa? Um, I'm not sure if I have anything else to add. I'm really grateful to be here and thank you for asking me to speak and good luck, everyone. Well, our parting words to Steve will be good luck on the rest of your anesthesia rotations. And if anybody else has any questions, please feel free to find me on Twitter, LinkedIn, the site, whatever. This will go up and stay up on YouTube. And then, oh, I almost forgot. I'm going to say goodbye to you two and go to our last screen. The To me, and we're going to come to this. How about this? And there's Kaisa Lar. <laughs> Terrible. Okay, well, January, let's see, can I get it that way? Nope. Okay, January 21st, <laughs> January 21st, 3 p.m. PST is going to be our next Educast. And um, that is it. So we will say goodbye to everyone. There we go. Look at that. I finally figured it out. Okay, uh, everybody stay safe and wear your masks and please physically distance. Oh, I didn't send it live.